Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time. In each episode of this podcast, we invite a special guest to take us on a tailored tour of the past. Travels Through Time is brought to you in partnership with History Today, Britain's best loved serious history magazine. You can read articles relating to this podcast and more about our guests at historytoday.com forward slash travels. There is also a special subscription offer for Travels Through Time listeners. Three issues for just one pound each. Hello, I'm Peter Moore and this is Travels Through Time, the podcast where we examine one year in the past through three different scenes. Today we're heading to one of the most dramatic, perilous and consequential moments in all British, some might even say world history, which is May 1940. And we're being taken there by a writer who knows the time better than almost anyone else, and that is Andrew Roberts. Through his books on subjects like Waterloo, Wellington and Napoleon, Andrew has become a Sunday Times and New York Times bestseller. His great biographical subject, though, is Sir Winston Churchill, the figure we're going to meet today. His first book, 30 years ago, was about Churchill, and he's written five books with Churchill's name in the subtitle or title since. And in October of last year, he published his major single volume biography of the statesman, Churchill Walking with Destiny. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Andrew. (laughs) Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Um, Before we start, I just want to ask you a little bit about Churchill's completely distinctive personality, because he is a figure that we all have in our minds in some way. But let's get back away from the legend to the person and the young man in particular. Um, Harold Macmillan, and this is a quote you put right at the start of your book, and I really like, he calls him a half English aristocrat and half American gambler. Um, But can you tell us a little bit about the younger Churchill? I'm thinking of the Churchill we might meet in around the year 1900. Well, the reason, of course, that Harold Macmillan called him that was that his mother was the daughter of an American gambler, a financial speculator, and his paternal grandfather was the Duke of Marlborough. And so he very much was this half one kind of person, half the other. And you very much get this in 1900 when he has been the world's best paid war correspondent. So he's willing to take the kind of risks that a speculator or gambler would take. He once said that there's nothing so exhilarating in life as to be shot at without result. (laughs) <laughs> and he also, of course, was the uh, the grandee in a sense as well, somebody who believed in the Tory democracy ideas of Benjamin Disraeli, who very much believed in noblesse oblige, mm. and uh, therefore also believed in the British Empire. So you have these things working together in the same person. Yeah, there's a wonderful bit in your book when you talk about the car that he first owned, the only French car that he had. And I always think you can tell a lot about a person by the car they own and the way they drive it. And you say that um, he had a French Moors, and is that how it's pronounced? Yes. I'm not sure. But he habitually drove fast, routinely jumped traffic lights, and occasionally went up onto the pavement when faced with traffic congestion. I think this just gives you a picture of, of Churchill trying out a bit of new technology, which he was always interested in. And uh, cutting corners. Cutting corners. Yes. And and sometimes going the wrong way around roundabouts as well. <laughs> right? Although that I, I never actually managed to, to, uh, to track down any examples of that. Mm. But yes, using the driving metaphor is a good one, in fact. Uh, he, he was a driving force, of course, and he liked to cut corners. Mm. Okay. To understand a man, Napoleon once said, look at the world when he was 20. That's fair. And I suppose when... When Churchill was about 20, the British Empire, as it was, was probably at its height in terms of extent and maybe in terms of confidence as well, would you say? And do you think this is, was that a sustaining ideal for Churchill? It really was all his life, yes. I think you're right. Uh, When he was 20, there were only three years off the... um, a Diamond Jubilee, which in many ways is the highest point of the whole of the British Empire. And he did, of course, famously say in 1942 that he did not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. And yet, ultimately, of course, by the time he died in 1965, the British Empire was pretty much all over and done with. Mm. And so he himself saw himself as a failure, which is extraordinary, considering that we, of course, must see him having been instrumental in helping win the Second World War as one of the great successes in life. Mm. So this young Churchill that I'm just dwelling on for a moment before we start is, I think, a really pugnacious character. He's on the make. He's in a a hurry. 
um, self-depreciating, interestingly, in certain cases. He's often quick to do down his intellect, which I, which always uh, intrigues me. The famous love for alcohol that we hear so much about is something you tackle in a book as well. You say that he was never really out of control drunk, as many imagined he was. No, he liked to show off about his drinking. I think you're right about his self-deprecating um, aspects. He uh, It's very rare for a politician to make himself out to be thicker than he genuinely mm. is, and yet Churchill did do that. In his, Even when it wasn't warranted as in, well. Entirely unnecessary. Uh, it was in My Early Life, his uh, autobiography. And actually, when you go back to his uh, school reports you see that he was in the top third of the class in pretty much every subject all the time yeah. so he actually wasn't this dunce that he made himself out and he's to very be. keen in, his, um, in that book in particular My Early Life to present himself as the greatest dunce that ever went into this school and, he, and he, he simply wasn't as even in Latin and Greek and the subjects that he claims to have been very bad at but with regard to alcohol and it is an important subject because it was used uh, of course, by the Nazis to try and make him out to be a hopeless alcoholic. Um, at one point, um, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, was worried about uh, whether or not he might have been an alcoholic, not because of anything that he'd observed himself, but just what he'd read and heard. And also, um, of course, some revisionist historians today still attempt to make him out to be a... The fact is that he did drink an enormous amount, there's no doubt about that. However, he did have the most extraordinary capacity for alcohol. He had an iron constitution. And I think that the person who gets it best uh, right is somebody who knew Churchill, the journalist C.P. Scott, who said that Winston Churchill couldn't have been an alcoholic because no alcoholic could have drunk that much. Mm, <laughs> that's, that's a nice way of putting it. And also, uh, there's, a, there's a nice quote here that you've got, which is... Uh, from Churchill himself when he says a single glass of champagne imparts a feeling of exhilaration the nerves are braced the imagination is agreeably stirred the wits become more nimble and this takes me on to the other thing that I wanted to just to but he also goes me. on sorry in that same quote to say that a bottle of champagne on the other hand has the opposite effect okay so there's a moderating force and we always forget the end of the quote okay that's interesting in itself but what I was thinking of kind of getting into the fact that he was just a very, very good writer as well. He had a wonderful clarity of expression. Because he was a good reader. Uh, when he was up in the northwest frontier in India in the uh, late 1890s, he read the whole of the Western canon, basically. It was mm. extraordinary how much he read. And especially great writers like Macaulay and Gibbon. Mm. He could quote Shakespeare for uh, you know hours at a time. And as a result, you have somebody who therefore was able to create phrases that will last really for as long as our language lasts. Mm, exactly. So to whiz from that, so I just wanted to kind of have that little picture of Churchill as a young man to begin with because it plays against everything he became later on and to whiz through the career of someone who did achieve high office at a relatively young age. He was one of the youngest serving cabinet officers in history at that time um, and then was active throughout the early part of the 20th century. Um, gained a reputation for having bad judgment generally but was also, um, you know, a continual force within British politics at this time. Well, bad judgment over over fairly important things like uh, women's suffrage and uh, the gold standard, the abdication crisis, the black and tans, the Dardanelles catastrophe. You know, there is a long list of things in which he did show bad judgment. But when it came to the really important things, the most important things of the 20th century, such as the rise of Prussian militarism, German Nazism and Soviet imperialism. He got each of those things right and in many cases was the only person to do so and the most prominent person to do so for a very long time. Yeah, and I think that's um, points you bring out wonderfully in the book and at the same time I think it's just the fact that his adversaries in Parliament were particularly clever at using this reputation he had as someone of poor judgment to keep him marginalised at this point. Um, That's right. Throughout, so the, throughout the late 30s. You perhaps. certainly see that, as you say, throughout the late 30s. The, uh, this long list of, uh, of mistakes he's made were used against him. And, um, and in a sense, perfectly reasonably, you know, mm. of course you should uh, be able to use a politician's previous actions mm. um, in, uh, against him. He'd certainly have used them had they all been successes in his, fa in his uh, um, favour. So um, it's not uh, entirely unfair, really. But nonetheless, um, when, I, when I mentioned about how some things were trivial and other things were important, really there was, in the late 1930s, nothing more important than warning against the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. 
Brilliant. So let's go to the heart of the matter, which is May 1940, where Churchill, who's been this figure for so, so long on the political scene, really starts to move towards the premiership. That's basically the arc of the story we're going to tell today. But it all starts really on the 7th of May with what you call the Norway debates. Do you want to tell us what the Norway debate was in Parliament? The debate on both the 7th and the 8th of May 1940, which is known to history as the Norway debate, was actually a debate on whether or not to adjourn the House of Commons. But because it took place in the immediate aftermath of the Allied defeat in Norway at the hands of the Germans, it obviously became a debate on uh, not only the government campaign in Norway, but also actually on the Chamberlain government itself. Mm. And therefore the fate of the government was in the balance at this uh, great two-day debate. Yeah, so you've got a like kind of long-standing policy of appeasement, which has then preceded the war in its opening stages through the winter of 1940. And then there's the extremely well-executed invasion of Norway and Denmark from the Nazis, which is the immediate contextual background to this. That's um, right. That happened on the 9th of April 1940. Yeah. And for the next month, the Allies, the French and uh, British, tried to fight against the Germans in Norway and by the time of the Norway debate it was clear that they'd been defeated. Yeah and in the House of Commons on this day obviously Churchill is there, Chamberlain, in a way he's the Prime Minister at the dispatch box but he's also a little bit like the um, I suppose the defendant on trial in a way and it seems to me like one of these classic set pieces from the Roman Empire when you have a you know kind of Cicero moment of lots of speeches being given you know, kind of in succession by important figures. Do you want to tell us a few of the people who would have been in the Commons on that day? Well, that's right. Actually, the, uh, when um, he attempted to defend his government the day before, um, Chamberlain started the debate on the seventh and made a and made a major speech. Then, of course, you had the leader of the Labour Party, Clement Attlee. Um, the deputy leader, Arthur Greenwood, the leader of the Liberal Party, Archie Sinclair. You had the various ministers who'd been involved in the Norway campaign. You had the Minister for Air, therefore, Sir Samuel Hoare, Oliver Stanley, the war minister. You had some of the most famous members of the House of Commons, such as the previous Prime Minister, Lloyd George. Also, you had important contributions made by former cabinet ministers, such as Leo Amory, um, you had a speech from the Admiral of the Fleet, who was also a Conservative MP called Sir Roger Keyes, who turned up with six rows of medal ribbons in his Admiral of the Fleet uniform. Tremendously imposing sight, as you can imagine. Um, he'd, uh, he'd won the Victoria Cross as well. And so there were a series of speeches made by uh, some of the most serious critics of the government, Alfred Duff Cooper, who had uh, resigned over the Munich um, Agreement in 1938 and others. And it was therefore an opportunity really for the whole House of Commons to have a, a debate about the future of the Chamberlain government. And uh, an awful lot of the people involved in it were either highly critical of the government or many who should have been defending the government really just stayed silent and didn't. There were an awful lot of abstentions. And this was uh, also something that was held to be highly detrimental for Chamberlain's chances of survival. Mm. So at the same time, I suppose there's an extra dimension to this as well, because whilst Chamberlain is maybe having lots of opinions broadcast or, or spoken loud about his performance as Prime Minister, you've got sitting very, very close to him the person that many would prefer to be in his place, Churchill. So that's a peculiar position for Churchill to be in. Would he be immensely enjoying this occasion, do you think? If he was enjoying the occasion, he wasn't allowed to make it clear. He very much had to defend the Prime Minister and the government, uh, not least, of course, because he had, in fact, in Norway, been equally as responsible for the decisions that were taken as anybody else. He was First Lord of the Admiralty, a very important position in charge of the Royal Navy, and it was a largely naval operation in Norway. So he had his own position to defend. And although there were some in the House of Commons who wanted him to take over 
rather than uh, have Chamberlain. Overwhelmingly, the largest body of opinion was that of the ordinary Conservative backbencher, and they tended to support Neville Chamberlain still very much. Mm. You see this, actually, when the vote was taken, when the government actually won that vote by 281 to 200. Mm. But because that was such a huge drop... The size of the majority. From the size of the majority yeah. from the previous general election in 1935, it was seen as a massive moral defeat for the government. But do you say at the same time there were these incredibly important figures in British politics making speeches? So you've got Lloyd George, who's critical, very critical. Maybe, you know, there's an element of revenge in what he's saying as well. Towards, very much, yes. Because um, um, no, no, um, Lloyd George um, hated Neville Chamberlain ever since he- Neville Chamberlain had been uh, instrumental in helping bring him down as Prime Minister in October 1922. He'd been waiting for this moment. He'd been sharpening his knife. He, uh, his kni- lo- knife was very sharp at this point. I he imagine. loathed yeah. Neville Chamberlain. And, and so when he said that everybody needed to make sacrifices in this war and what the Prime Minister needed to do was to sacrifice the seals of office. Mm. It was a jibe that he'd been waiting for years to make. The intervention I always think of being hugely significant that you mention is the one from Leo Amory when he says, you've sat here too long for any good you've been doing, which is an echo of Cromwell, isn't it? A not? direct quote from Oliver Cromwell yeah. um, in uh, in expelling one of the parliaments. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you in the name of God, go. And it's one of those lines, isn't it, that just, it must... You know, you talk about Chamberlain being white as chalk as he sat there listening to these verdicts on his leadership. And he won the vote, but there was a great moral loss of power, wasn't there? That's right. And so his suddenly his um, uh, premiership was flung into uh, huge doubt. And it was felt, especially by senior figures in the Conservative Party, that uh, what was needed more than anything else really was a national government, a proper national government, in which the Labour Party and the Liberal Party came in and therefore presented to Hitler a um, united coalition. And uh, the question then was going to be whether or not Labour and the Liberals would be willing to enter that government with Neville Chamberlain as the Prime Minister. It's a tremendous set piece scene, really is. And you mentioned that very strangely for um, the House of Commons at this point, there are some visual records of what was happening. Was there a surreptitious photographer in the gallery or was it something there was like... Well, no, there was an actual MP. He wasn't in the gallery. He was on the floor of the House of Commons. He was called John Moore Brabazon. He had bought a little Minox camera, yeah. a tiny little thing, about only one inch by two inches or so. And against all the rules of the House of Commons, he started taking photographs of the actual Norway debate as it was going on. This is very unusual at this time unknown. to have a visual record Entire, of such an important occasion. Entirely unknown. And it's the only one that we have, actually, of, of the House of Commons sitting at that time. What can we see in these photos? Are they clear? or They're they not. They're fairly smudgy, but we can see Chamberlain on his feet. We can see Winston Churchill sitting down quite close to him. We can see how packed the House of Commons was. There was there was no room whatsoever for anybody. We can see the, the benches, therefore, completely full of people. It's, a, it's fascinating to see how many people, all looking incredibly smart, of course. And, I mean, everybody, of course, wore stiff collars and ties and things like that. It was, uh, in that sense, very orderly but it became very disorderly at the end of the debate when people started uh, shouting and yelling and some people started to try and sing rule britannia and they were shouted down by people of their own party there were uh, people yelling at the prime minister to resign and it all started getting very noisy yeah and i mean i'm just trying to think well were you there i suppose it'd be a transfixing occasion and and really, it's difficult to think of an analogy for something in, in my lifetime with the great parliamentary occasions of maybe Robin Cook making a speech on the eve of the war with Iraq in 2003, or maybe before that, when you have Jeffrey Howe talking about cricket bats and at the end of Margaret Thatcher's time. I think if but you, think if you add all of those put on. together, including all the upsets over Brexit uh, one way and another, and uh, everything that we've had to do with the Iraq war, and you uh, multiply them all by five, you still don't get quite the um, sense of the Norway debate, which is, of course, actually taking place in a world war. Because everyone knows at this time Hitler has all these armoured divisions, they're just sitting on the border. Nothing's happened yet. The the attack could happen at any time. And he's already taken Poland, he's already taken, as we mentioned earlier, Denmark and, and Norway. So whilst you have the Arch of Pisa in the dock, so to speak, 
you have Churchill very close by and he's someone who said this is a quote I love it's probably the best um, my favorite of Churchill's quotes before the war when he said certainly a very terrible war is going to happen I think he said this at All Souls in Oxford you know the quote completely in which London will be bombed and Buckingham Palace will be razed to the ground and the lions and tigers will escape from the zoo and roam through the streets of London attacking people that's very Churchillian isn't it it's kind of the like the clever vivid image but at the heart of it quite a serious message well and actually funny enough a zebra did escape from uh, <laughs> from Regent's Park Zoo uh, yeah. during the Blitz and in the Berlin Zoo they had to put down all the uh, crocodiles and the lions and tigers because they feared the same thing was going to happen I mean obviously Buckingham Palace was bombed but wasn't raised to the ground but plenty of other very important buildings in London were so this was not scaremongering yeah and plenty of crocodiles in the commons that day well let's go from that to your next scene the second scene is uh, number 10 Downing Street on the 9th of May 1940 now this is a completely hinge moment isn't it because the debate has been had Chamberlain's waking up in the morning hoping at this point I think is that is this right to cling on to power Yes, that's right. Uh, so on the morning of Thursday, the 9th of May, um, Chamberlain sent out his whips in order to try to ensure that he could stay as Prime Minister by effecting a reconstruction of the government and dumping a few of the ministers who he thought were unpopular and bring the Labour Party in under his premiership. And so a lot of horse trading is going on mm -hmm. in Number 10 and uh, MPs are being brought in to see whether or not they could support the government under certain circumstances and threats are being made and promises are being made. But at the same time, in the afternoon, when it becomes pretty clear that Chamberlain can't survive, the Labour Party turn up, or at least two members of them, the leader and the deputy leader, Clement Attlee and Arthur Greenwood, and they have a meeting at which they tell Neville Chamberlain and Winston Churchill and the Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, who is another person who could become Prime Minister, that they will go away and decide whether or not they will go down to the Labour Party in Bournemouth and they will decide, which is having its conference, and decide whether or not to enter the government. So were you in Downing Street on the 9th of May? In 1940, this would be a place of huge activity, lots of tension, um, and lots right. of uncertainty, really. More and, than anything. and what happened when the Labour leaders uh, left was that um, um, David Margerson, the chief whip, uh, came in and started to explain, really, the, the political situation in the House of Commons. And it pretty much dawned on Neville Chamberlain at this point that he wasn't going to be able to survive. And sure enough, when the Labour Party reported from Bournemouth later on, they said that they wouldn't go into a national government under Neville Chamberlain. And so it became clear that it had to be either Lord Halifax or Winston Churchill who was going to become Prime Minister. Because I was thinking in a way there was three outcomes that were possible. Chamberlain stays, Halifax becomes Prime Minister or, or Churchill accedes to the Premiership. But really, it's not possible for Chamberlain to stay at all. It's between the two of them, really. Is that he right? could. He had the numbers in the House of Commons to stay if he'd wanted to, um, but um, but actually, he was pretty much holed below the waterline, um, really. And uh, and if the government um, needed to turn into a national government by bringing in Labour and the Liberals, then he couldn't stay as Prime Minister. Now, at four thirty in the afternoon. The afternoon's drawing long as a meeting between with four people you mention are at this meeting and it's unminuted. Often when I talk to historians in this podcast, they like to be at a particular moment to see what was happening at, at a particular time. I wonder whether you'd have liked to have been in the room at this meeting, eavesdropping on, because this seems completely crucial to the events as they as they unfold. If you'd brought a small guillotine, Peter, I would allow you to chop off my left finger in order <laughs> for me to have been a flower on the wall. Well, there is a meeting. guillotine. Just... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would have been absolutely fascinating to have seen precisely what was said. Can you tell because, us about the four people that were in this meeting? Well, um, Neville Chamberlain and Winston Churchill, of course, were two. The other one was Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, who was uh, a politician, had been since he was in his early 20s, He'd been Viceroy of India. He was a very serious and substantial figure, a fox hunting, Anglo Catholic Christian, who was somebody who could easily have become Prime Minister. He certainly had the CV for it. 
Um, but the question is whether or not he had the, the stomach for it and whether he wanted to become Prime Minister and to stymie Winston Churchill, who, of course, had been waiting his whole life to become Prime Minister and who yeah. wanted to be really ever since he'd been in, uh, got into the House of Commons in his 20s. So it seems to me, reading your evaluation of this, that the, the logical conclusion of what should have happened that day, if you look at numbers, if you look at like the interests of various different factions and parties and people who are important, Halifax is the more likely of the two to become Prime Minister. Yes, if it was um, down to a vote of the Conservative Party, Halifax would have got it, or pretty much any other wider group. The King wanted Halifax, the Times wanted Halifax, the Cabinet overall would have voted for Halifax, House of Lords wanted Halifax, and as I say, the uh, Parliamentary Party and also the wider party in the country would probably have gone for Halifax as well. So really the only constituency that was going to, uh, only group that was going to go for uh, Churchill was Churchill himself. As it turned out, these four people in the um, in the cabinet room at that particular time, at that particular place and moment in history. So it really was uh, extraordinarily lucky for Churchill to have been appointed by these uh, four aristocratic white males. Yeah, it wasn't uh, a, it all wasn't of them. a very democratic process. Uh, no, it was not at all, no. I mean, uh, I mean, Neville Chamberlain came from the middle classes, but the rest of them were upper class. They were yeah. all people who were... MPs, of course, but but that's about it. Mm. <laughs> and they decided this man, Winston Churchill, was going to be called on by the king if the Labour Party decided not to join the government under Chamberlain, which is mm. exactly what I'm happened. sure you'll correct me if I get this wrong, but isn't it one e- old Etonian, two old Herovians, and one from rugby school? Is that the, that this was the electorate we're talking about? All public this? school boys and very much Oxbridge types. Mm. And indeed, had Neville Chamberlain's father, Joseph, survived and not died young, or at least died early, he would probably have been an earl himself mm. so all four of them would have been aristocrats is it, is it useful at this point to cast our minds back to the analogy of churchill's driving with the like kind of him spotting a shortcut because one of the questions you ask is whether churchill was offered this job or whether he saw an opportunity and grabbed yes well that's right there's a huge um debate about exactly what was said which is one of the reasons that i'd like to be the fly on the wall um and no because lots of um of accounts have been given of this meeting uh, all of the people there um, had different recollections of it. Winston Churchill's is, I believe, the least believable of them. Uh, not only did he get the time of, and the date of the meeting wrong and the number of people in the room wrong, uh, but he also claimed that there was a two-minute silence. He said something like the Armistice Day silence, which was, of course, two minutes, very long silence, before Lord Halifax agreed to let him be Prime Minister instead of himself. I don't believe this for a moment. He had all his life always argued for every place he'd done ever got in uh, politics and I think he set out his stall and insisted on the premiership and that certainly is not contradicted by any of the other accounts Mm. Um, the idea that this he just waited at this key moment in his life for this plum job that he'd always wanted to fall into his lap I I simply don't think is uh, is is believable or tenable it's all in chapter 19 of my book because what I've done is to place is to give the reader everybody's different view on it and so if you want to take a different aspect or, or, or um, uh, take away a different idea then of course you're in every position to do so and what I personally think happened is that Churchill demanded the job and are we to understand that by the time they left that room and that meeting this unminuted meeting Churchill was to be it was understood that he was... Well, it wasn't an official meeting, you see. It wasn't like a cabinet meeting or a committee meeting. There was no reason... But the important ones rarely are, are they? Well, exactly. It was a party meeting between between four Tories, and that would not have been minuted. There's nothing suspicious about the fact that it was unminuted. I I only think it's suspicious from, like, the historical curiosity of the moment that, Mm. you, you know, sometimes the most interesting history comes where you can't see with clarity what happens and you have to kind of project your And they were all extremely busy. You know, there was a war on. They all had other things to do. There was a massive uh, uh, constitutional and uh, political crisis going on. So they didn't all then sit down and write down what everybody had said. They had to remember it years later, some of them, or they told other people who then did write it down. But it wasn't, um, uh, as you say, this is is part of of the fascination for history. Third and last, we're in Buckingham Palace, the next day, 10th of May, 1940. 
But overnight, is this correct? They've had news of the Nazi invasion. Is that correct? That's right. At dawn on uh, the 10th, uh, Friday the 10th of May 1940, Hitler unleashed Blitzkrieg on the West, invading Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg. And so, and of course, shortly afterwards, uh, a few days later, he was to invade France as well. And so when the cabinet met early that morning, it was in a state of uh, extreme crisis because the government was faced with this huge invasion in the, in the West. Uh, the, the army was fighting on the Western Front and Chamberlain attempted to use this new crisis to stay in office and to argue that uh, you couldn't have a change of prime minister in the middle of, of a massive crisis like this. But Sounds in, familiar. But in fact, <laughs> there had to be Yes, absolutely. But in fact, there um, there had to be a change of, of prime minister because they needed to get the Labour Party in now. And this was pointed out even by a loyalist supporter of Chamberlain's called Sir Kingsley Wood, who said that, uh, in fact, the new crisis meant that uh, Chamberlain most definitely did have to go. And sure enough, he did. He went to Buckingham Palace and tendered his resignation to the king. And the king, King George VI, actually suggested Halifax at this point as prime minister and said that his peerage could be put into abeyance. Mm. So he um, could appear in the House of Commons. So he could appear in the House of Commons, not necessarily vote, but speak in the yeah. House of Commons. But by that stage... Chamberlain had agreed, of course, the day before this key meeting that we were just speaking about on the 9th, to have Churchill as Prime Minister, not mm. Lord Halifax. And he made that clear to the King. And so sometime after 6pm that evening, the King called for Churchill to Buckingham Palace for an audience. So with that, this is like almost the, the third stage of a, a process going on here, because we've seen Churchill in a way, being given the support of the Commons um, during the Norway debate. Then we've gone to a much smaller cluster of very powerful people right at the heart of government. He's come out of that. But now he's going to meet the King, which is the very formal part of the constitutional process of becoming Prime Minister. It's a little bit more complicated than that, in that he didn't get any kind of support from the House of Commons to be Prime Minister at the Norway debate. All that the Norway debate did was to undermine Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Okay. Uh, what happened on the second day, you're right, it was this small group of people choosing Churchill. But then you also did need, constitutionally, you did need the King. But the King was, of course, going to stick by his constitutional duty which was to appoint the person who the outgoing prime minister suggested mm. and who could retain the confidence of the house of commons and uh, winston churchill was able to do that mm. the dynamics between the king and churchill then not good necessarily at the beginning because of course um churchill had supported the king's elder brother king edward the eighth during the abdication crisis and also the king had been a staunch supporter of neville chamberlain and the policy of appeasement and had invited Chamberlain up onto the balcony at Buckingham Palace at the time of Munich. So they could have very easily not gone on, but in fact they got on immediately, extremely well. And in the King's Diary, he refers to Churchill as his friend. He soon was referring to him, calling him Winston, the only one of his four prime ministers he called by his Christian name. And the two men very, very quickly got on like a house on fire. Mm. So uh, incredibly. And whenever a new prime minister goes to meet the monarch, there's always, it always seems to me a very vivid occasion. Um, I suppose we have in our head pictures of people awkwardly going into the room and backing out. And would, would there have been all of this going on um, at the time, not turning your back on the monarch, for example, and having to, um, I suppose, go through the polite introductions? Oh, would yes. you like to but, um, form yes. a government in no. my name, etc.? Well, well, actually, funny enough, it started with a joke. Uh, the king, uh, or at least it started with what Churchill thought was a joke. The king said, I don't suppose you know why I've invited you here. Well, of course, Churchill took it for granted that he'd been invited in order to form a government. And so he, playing along with what he thought was the joke, said, I can't imagine your majesty. Then the king said, well, I want you to form a government. And, and Churchill agreed to do so. But actually what happens, what I've discovered uh, from the king's diary, the queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diary, wartime diary. And actually what he writes in his wartime diary was that Winston Churchill had no idea why I'd summoned him. So when he had said, I don't suppose you know why I've invited you here, he actually thought that Churchill hadn't any idea that he was about to be made Prime Minister, which so, is the most extraordinary thing. 
it, it's a yeah it's a bit like like a little dash of comedy right in the middle of this an incredibly dramatic moment when you have invasions happening in on the continent unintended very sort of british comedy yeah well it's because, very british yeah. because uh, because the king said something that he didn't consider to be a joke which winston churchill took as a joke and uh, and responded with a joke so actually it was um, a very very strange way to start but as as i think i mentioned earlier they very soon very quickly managed to make a extremely effective friendship not just a wartime friendship but something that uh, really deeply mattered to both men but were you there on that day i suppose it's the idea that you'd be looking at the culmination of a very you know short process of a few days time which has kind of completely altered the nature of Britain at this moment. Is that right? So the, the oh, Britain of, like, the, say, the 5th of May, for example, with Chamberlain at the head of government, and the Britain of 11th of May. Oh, in less than that. In 72 hours, you'd gone from a situation where there had been a pretty undistinguished, dithering government facing no immediate assault in the West to a Winston Churchill government of growling defiance facing the full onslaught of the Nazi blitzkrieg. So everything changed in those three days, the whole, really, Western civilization. Well, thank you very much for, like, kind of guiding us through that process. Absolutely brilliant. If you had the ability to bring one object back from this moment in uh, 1940 to today, what would you like to bring with you? Am I allowed to bring one that's only two days later? No, I, I think we can like kind of liberalise. Thank the you, rules Peter. Well, in that case, I appreciate that. Thank you. It would be his, uh, be Winston Churchill's blood, toil, tears, and sweat speech that he made in the House of Commons as Prime Minister. Would uh, this be the like kind of the notes for it, or the, it would, the actual it, script? It would be the actual script. Right, it's wow. in the in the Churchill Papers at uh, Churchill College archives. I would like to liberate it from the archives and keep it in my house. So that would be the thing that I would uh, like to do. Oh, with, I don't, um, don't think you can do much, that too, okay? much better than that. Just a few words about the book, um, Walking with Destiny. I mean, the whole... Um, the whole idea of the book really is based around this this idea that you've got that from a very young man or a boy even Churchill had a feeling or you know a foresight even maybe more than that I don't know that he was going to be the person who one day would save the British from an invasion indeed you've got like an account of him as a 16 year old boy um, on the 10th of May 1940 that great day on which he became Prime Minister um, he was to write of that day later I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And what I've tried to do in this book is to look at the beginning part of that sentence, the bit about walking with destiny, because ever since he was a 16-year-old schoolboy, he had told his best friend that he believed in their lives that there would be great struggles, great upheavals, and uh, that Britain would be in danger of invasion and that he would be called upon to save London and save England. And, of course, half a century later, that's exactly what happened. And this sense of destiny is something that he kept with him throughout his life, and it was only underpinned by the many occasions in which he had close brushes with death, both in peacetime and, of course, in wartime. And so it is a, um, an essential part of understanding Winston Churchill, this concept of his walking with destiny well you divide the book into two parts which you have the preparation and the trial and what i really liked about our scene selection is they're right in the middle when all the preparation has been done the trial is just beginning it's a wonderful achievement many congratulations on the book and uh, it's been a multiple book of the year there's a quote from lord hailsham and he says uh, the one case in which i think i can see the finger of God in contemporary history is Churchill's arrival at the premiership at that precise moment. Let's leave it there. Thank you very much for talking with us today on Travels Through Time, Andrew Roberts. Thank you, Peter. I'm Paul Lay, the editor of History Today. On our website, you'll find articles written by experts relating to Andrew Roberts' travels. You can read Taylor Downing on how Churchill came to power. Piers Mackesy on the scapegoats of the Norway campaign, while Tony Caulfield explains why Prime Minister Chamberlain fell. Links to all of these pieces can be found at historytoday.com forward slash travels.
and there are many more articles on every aspect of the past in our monthly publication, History Today, the world's leading series history magazine.